Okay, it's my uh, great pleasure to uh, introduce uh, Casey Mulligan from uh, University of uh, Chicago. Um, uh, normally, I host uh, people who are working on programming and program verification, decision procedures, um, and uh, but uh, uh, th this is uh, quite different uh, uh, in this case. Um, Casey's background is in economics, which I have absolutely no clue about, uh, but we intersect on uh, automated reasoning, so I look forward to both learn about uh, uses in economics and um, the, the kind of reasoning that uh, Casey has been doing. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. I wanted to start out by just expressing my appreciation for the work that you guys do on program verification. I mean, in my life, it's been very, very handy um, because it really does economics. I want to show you today w where that overlap is. There's tremendous overlap. I'm using these kind of tools on a daily basis. Um, it's saving me all kinds of time. Um, so I thought the least I could do is come here and say thank you and give you an idea that there's potential customers out there f like me for, for what you do. Um, and it's always good to have your customer in mind and continue doing this great work you're doing. Um, so I'm going to start by looking at some typical reasoning tasks in, in economics. They're typical in the sense that I run into them all the time and my colleagues run into them all the time. And it turns out that they're amenable to the types of algorithms that you guys have put together. Um, and I've used these now for two years, my day-to-day -day work, um, teaching economics, researching economics, uh, advising economics, writing a textbook in economics, these tools I use for all those things. Um, and I've, to date, uh, I do have a tally in my computer. I didn't check it, but it's in the thousands of reasoning tasks that I've used. Uh, and quantifier elimination engine of some kind always works. Um, I use it a thousand times, no failures. Um, so the kind of workhorse reasoning tasks in economics, probably in a lot of other areas too, is, is a deduction exercise. We have a set of assumptions A and a hypothesis H, and we want to know, does the hypothesis follow from the assumptions? Um, and you can think of this as a pair of decision problems, one asking, does there exist um, an example where the assumption and the hypothesis are both true, and does there exist a counterexample where the assumption is true but the hypothesis is not? Um, and that's, that's, the, that's the kind of workhorse. That gives you kind of four possibilities. I'm going to show you some screenshots where the software is putting out one of the four. And this is how I interpret um, the output as it's telling us about simultaneously about these two uh, decision problems. Now, this notation I, th I think is familiar to the algorithm experts. Um, but there may be some economists who take a look at this, so I'm going to explain a little bit. Um, this is not notation from, from our field, really. So the square brackets part is a collection of inequalities and equations joined together with logical connectors, and, and, or, or. Um, and by putting the existential quantifier outside that, we're asking whether there's a way to satisfy that formula, either the counterexample formula or the example formula. And if those atoms are in the right language, then the square bracket term, a lot of people call it the Tarski formula, that's what I call it. And then this is a satisfiability question, and the type of question that say Z3 um, and other quantifier elimination engines are designed to answer that automatically. Okay, so let's show you, let me show you an application from economics. Um, this relates to a debate about the recession, which I personally got engaged with. Um, a recession, by the way, by definition, it's a time when the amount of labor goes down. That's how we define a recession. Now, the great question is, why do those happen? And why did the latest one in, a, in the United States and elsewhere in the world happen? And I, I have my opinion. I wrote a book about this saying, hey, most of the reason why labor went down, not all the reason, but most, is because of new set of federal policies that were rewarding low incomes and, and rewarding not working. So that's the primary reason I say 
why we had low incomes and less work. Um, a lot of people disagree with me on that. Some of you probably disagree with me on that. And, and uh, there's a lot of aspects of that disagreement. But part of the disagreement, I was approached by some of my colleagues, and Professor Krugman would be one of them, who said, this, they made a logical statement about how supply and demand works. And that's something that Z3 and these other engines can check for us. We, of course, argue about other things too. But let's just look at the logical statement, um, which said, what he said is, hey, whenever there's a recession, that's primarily due to taxes, discouraging work. Whenever you have a recession like that, then wages go up. That's, that's a logical statement uh, that we can check. It's also an example of a typical task in economics, especially a, a task that requires some effort of scenario analysis. Because there's a couple different scenarios that are embedded in this statement. One is what actually happened. And one is what would have happened if we wouldn't had this change in taxes. Um, so there's a kind of two things you got to track at, the, track at the same time. Machines are great at that. People maybe are less great as we'll we'll see. Okay, so here's how I kind of put it in the Tarski framework. As I said, we were talking about two scenarios. One is what actually happened, which is some combination of supply and demand factors. Um, that happened. And then a hypothetical scenario is like, oh, well, what would have happened if there had been no change in demand and all that happened was these tax changes? Um, now, demand's going to equal supply. I've set up a interface, if you will, in Mathematica that kind of takes the expressions the way economists talk to each other, recognize the Tarski formula inside there, decide what quantifier elimination algorithms to use to decide that question and then spit back the answer. So this is screenshots from kind of my interface. Um, so we have some assumptions here. Economically, these are assumptions about how the demand and supply work. One is the demand curve slopes down. Demand for labor depends on the wage and other things. Slopes down in the wage. Uh, the supply curve of labor slopes up in the wage. Um, and we have a few normalizations since we're not saying anything about what the units of AD or AS. Those are other things that shift supply and demand. We're not saying anything about their units. We normalize those effects. Um, and then we define what the two scenarios are. Um, both scenarios involve going from one supply and demand equilibrium, say in 2007, to another one in 2009. Um, so they have that to it. But they also... Um, both scenarios have the same supply shift. They both have these new taxes that came in. Um, but what's different about the hypothetical scenario is it had no demand shift. Because that's what Krugman and I were arguing about. What actually happened versus what would have happened if supply had been the only thing going on. And what I said, and he disagreed with, I said, you know, most of what happened to the quantity of labor Q would have happened anyway. More than half of what actually happened to the quantity of labor would have happened anyway. Um, and Krugman says, if you're dumb enough to be like Casey and think that that would happen, then wages must go up, uh, must have gone up. That, that was his logical statement. And we can ask the computer uh, if it was correct. Now, as I said before, if the formulas are in the right language, this fits in the Tarski framework. Well, these formulas are in their light, right language. Namely, there are polynomial inequalities um, or equations. This is, there's been a lot of confusion in economics about this point. So I want to be extra clear. Um, I'm not saying that the demand for labor is a polynomial function of the wage, a core tick in the wage or something like that. Or I'm not saying the supply of labor is polynomial in the wage. There's kind of an area of an economics that looks at polynomial functions like that. It's called semi-algebraic economics. I'm not doing semi-algebraic economics. I'm just saying let's be clever about how we define the variables. And when we do that, these are polynomial inequalities. In particular, if we say that there are 12 variables involved, four partial derivatives, and eight total derivatives, if each one of those is a variable, then this is a polynomial system, regardless of what function D might be or S might be. As long as it's differentiable and we can talk about its derivatives, it doesn't matter if it's a log function or a polynomial function or any other 
uh, function. So this, this fits in the Tarski framework and we can use all the tools that have been developed around that. Okay, and then we can, uh, my little interface will, you hit uh, shift enter on that and it gives an answer, one of the four boxes I showed you earlier, in this case, is, is the mixed answer. Yeah, there's examples, but there's also counterexamples. Now naturally, what, what I did when people were telling me, hey, wages, if, Casey, if you're right, wages are going to go up, naturally I said, no, that's not necessarily the case, and I wanted a counterexample. So here's a picture of a counterexample. The machine can give a counterexample, and I can draw a picture that, that obeys that. Um, supply and demand for labor. And you can see there's 2007 and 2010 is to the left. We had a recession, labor went to the left, okay. Um, and then there's a hypothetical equilibrium that would have happened if there had been no demand shift. And the red is closer to the 2010 than it is in to, the, to the 2007, the way I drew it here, which is what I said that, hey, most of what actually happened would have happened anyway. But nonetheless, the wage went down. That's a counterexample. So that's, uh, that's one place it can help. Now, let's go back to the point I cut off the top here. Let's go back to the point where the machine said, hey, this is a mixed case. There's both kinds, examples and counterexamples. I would also be interesting to have a formula for the counterexamples or a formula that somehow distinguishes the examples from the counterexamples. Um, for us economists, that would be a nice thing to have. And that's also a quantifier elimination problem if we just leave a couple variables free. And that's, uh, I have a button for that. Say so let's leave the supply slope and the demand slope as free variables and do the quantifier elimination and it gives back this formula which is saying that, remember the demand slope is negative and the supply slope is positive, it's saying hey, the supply curve has to be more sensitive to wages than the demand curve is. If you assume that, then Krugman's collusion would be correct. That's an extra assumption that you need, uh, or you could use to make it happen. And this example has that feature. The supply curve is pretty steep, supply is not very sensitive to uh, wages, and the demand curve is more sensitive. So that's a, that's a kind of example of the exercises that that we do. Yeah. Do you think you could talk through this figure a bit more? About, sure. Uh, uh, the blue lines and the green lines. Uh, um, sorry, I'm a bit naive about the economics. I mean, so, so the, the uh, kind of neon greens, those are supply supply of labor. Okay. Um, and the dashed ones are the ones that were present in 2007. The blue ones are demand for labor. So in 2007, there was a labor market equilibrium where supply equaled demand at one. One is defined to be what it was in 2007. That'd be like 140 million workers. Um, and then supply and demand shifted over time so that by 2010, they were both in a different place and we got a different amount of workers and a different wage. Um, and what Krugman and I were arguing about was logical statements about how this system works. So just yeah. interesting, do you, do you know the slopes of these lines? We, are, we also have areas of economics that look at the slopes. Okay. And they would tend to draw the slopes the way it is in this picture. Um, we tend to think that supply is less wage sensitive than demand is. So the way I drew it, which is the opposite of what Krugman needs to assume. Maybe that's why he didn't mention that you need to assume this. At the very least, this is a point that people would want to know. It's like, okay, this boils down to the slopes and let's talk to each other about what the slopes are. Um, yeah? Why did you assume that the uh, uh, supply of labor is going to shift left anyway? Well, that was my book about what we had a lot of new policies that have new ways of helping people when they're out of work. And that tends to shift supply to the left. When you make the, the supply and demand model views work as, work as a choice. And when you make the not work outcome less painful, then people are less willing to choose the work outcome than they used to be by comparison. We're not saying work is going to be zero, 
Of course not. It wasn't zero. It was 128 million people or something were still working. But um, when you say the policy, you mean like the quantitative easing or no? These were mostly uh, policies around food stamps, health insurance for people who were unemployed, uh, cash benefits for people who were unemployed, um, variety of programs like that, uh, mortgage assistance for people who were unemployed. There was a whole bunch of new things that you could get when you're unemployed in 2010 you couldn't get in 2007. And they still uh, live on? No, the, the stimulus expired. Okay. Um, and I have a lecture I give about that, and we had a kind of a recovery. Now we have Obamacare, which has a lot of those things put in, in with different names. Yeah. So that's kind of stimulus part two, but which is not set to expire. Okay. And this is going to shift the uh, labor to the left as well? Yeah. Yep. Ask about your judgment. Did Krugman make an, an anonymous mistake, or he was cunning and saying this because it supports his political views? Uh, I don't know. <laughs> Those are both interesting hypotheses. <laughs> I wouldn't wrestle you um, in favor of one or the other. Probably one. Probably one of the two, but. Um, it's a good policy to judge, and it, judge it, the I, well, I should add, he's not the only one who told me. I had a number of economics professors who approached me and said, Casey, you have this theory about how supply shifted to the left, but wages haven't gone up, so you're wrong. And then I pull out this picture. I said, hey, not necessarily. You've got to tell me more. I also argued that wages went up. That's another part of the book. But even if we accept that, this is, we just stick to the logical part of things. So, uh, Casey, yeah. to, be, to be clear, because I apologize because I was a bit late, but it strikes me that what, what you're trying to do is you're saying after the, after the recession occurred, the federal government put in a bunch of policies to like extend unemployment uh, durations and, and things like this to respond to the bad economic conditions. As This has the effect of effectively shifting the supply curve to the left, and what you're trying to do is decompose the decrease in, in, in employment that we observe in the economy across the leftward shift of the labor demand curve and then also the leftward shift of the supply curve. Yes. And the claim was that um, over 50% of the decrease in employment that we saw was due to the labor supply curve shifting to the yes. left in response to these policies. Yes. Got it. That was the bottom line of the book. And the critique of the book I got from people is say, oh, but if that were correct, wages would have gone up. Well, that's a silly thing to say. I, it is silly. And that was the next point I was going to come to, that this type of logical question I'd expect my undergrads to get correct, especially if I erased the names of the variables and just label them in a very abstract, bland way, like X and Y or Q and P or something like that, mm -hmm. so that there was no passion flowing on the test, I'd expect them to get the right answer. I'd be angry with them if they didn't get the right answer. But that's part of what we do is we're passionate and we don't reason clearly. And that's why your machines are wonderful, because your machines don't have that passion running. So um, no passion. <laughs> we have so, passion for software. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, but your so, software doesn't have passion yet, does it? <laughs> so there you go. We're working on that. Yeah. <laughs> I figured. I figured. <laughs> so, um, so to be very clear then, um, I guess, is the point that some of the critiques of this argument were, was, was it more of that relative to the counter, I mean, the right way to think about that question, or at least a different way of thinking about that question, is to say relative to the world where the um, where the labor supply curve didn't shift to the left, wages have gone up, right? So basically, this the point that you don't have labeled is where the dotted green line is yes. intersecting with the solid purple line. And so relative to that point, yeah. wages have gone up. Yeah. And then it's just a question of, well, what are the magnitude of the two slopes, yeah. you know, that we're talking about here? So is, is there any way that sort of that's what was lost? And, and so, like, two ships were passing in the night? I, that's another reason why putting in the machine is excellent, because then we can all know exactly what we're saying. I certainly yeah. agree with that. And that's, that's what I'm trying to push today, um, is economics could be cheaper and better and more accurate 
if we use the machines to, to help us. Suck. Yeah. Um, <laughs> what, uh, can, yeah. You, can you get can you yeah. the uh, slide? So what are the wages after the, uh, uh, the stimulus? Which point is, is the wages after stimulus? Uh, here. Okay. All right. the stimulus was still going here. Stimulus started to expire in, in 2011. So I, what's your reply to the wages uh, didn't go up? Uh, how do you explain that they didn't go up? Like, uh, then the stimulus was, uh, was ineffective in, in general. Well, I agree that stimulus is ineffective. In fact, it was worse than ineffective. It made labor go even more to the left than it would have. Without stimulus, labor would have been here. I mean, I'm sorry. Uh, well, without stimulus, labor would have been. That's right. Yeah. That's the point. Without. Uh, it's, the, it's the slope where the dotted line, dotted green, intersects with purple. Yeah. Without stimulus, we would have been here. And with stimulus, we ended up over here. That's. Well, with respect to labor outcomes. With respect to the quantity of labor, right? Yes, exactly. Yeah. To be clear. Now, as we, we discovered, this is kind of an easy example. So th this next example is, is harder, less interesting, but harder. And I've given it to some of the smartest people in, in our field, uh, and they know that I'm trying to trick them, and they still say, I don't get it. <laughs> um, so this is a uh, typical model we would use to start kind of first thinking about taxation, so quite a simple setup. Um, there's, in this economy, there's only one type of person. They're, they're all the same type of person, people. That's it's simple in that sense. People have kind of two things they care about, their leisure time and how much money they have to spend. And working is a way that they give up leisure time in order to have money to spend. Um, that kind of simple set up. It's, it's known in these, these type of, this type of economy, even though it's simple, the outcomes can be complicated in the sense that if the government tries to raise revenue in that type of economy by taxing people's income from work, that there's two ways to get, the, at least two ways to get the same amount of revenue. One would be a low tax rate where people work a lot and generate a lot of income. Another would be a high tax rate where people don't work much, and even though it's each unit of income is taxed a lot, there's not much income to tax. And that's called the Laffer Curve. Uh, more recently, it's been called the Laffer Curve, um, although the idea is much older than, than Mr. Laffer. So that, we all know in my field that there's, that there's a Laffer Curve to think about on these different points to give the same revenue. The hard question is, if we compare the low tax point to the high tax point, both giving the same revenue, is the worker better off at the low tax point than the high tax point? And the revenue here is just given back to the people. So it's not like they're using the revenue for, for the military or the opera or something that people might enjoy, national parks. They're just giving the revenue back to the people. And I asked, could people be better off at the low tax rate? And the gut reaction that people have in my profession, and, and even when they think harder about it, is like, yeah, they must the low tax rate is less distortive, so they must be better off. Um, but you pass this to, say, Z3, and Z3 will say, no, there's a counterexample. And Z3 will spit out a counterexample, um, values for all these variables that actually have UL being smaller than UH. So I generate a counterexample. I, in this case, I use Mathematica, I would say, but I know that Z3 also generates an example. And then I put together a little economy that satisfies that example, means has all these variables values at, at a point. And I drew the Laffer curve for that economy. Um, yeah. Can you explain what, what are the qualities? You know, before there was this equilibrium, and, and now what, what do you hang it on? The whole reasoning. So there are qualities. What, what, what are they? The equalities? Yes. Well, we call these revealed preference, which says, okay, when people who live in the low-tax economy, there's some amount they work, NL, and they prefer that to working any other amount. They're doing their best. And that's what this means. Um, and now, if they work different amounts, they can spend different amounts, and this equation is telling us, okay, 
if you decide to work differently, here's what you're going to consume differently. And that's an equation. Their, their household budget constraint is an equation that says your income equals your spending. So that's why there's equations. Um, another case that I end up with equations in problems like this are from definitions. I might want to define a combination of these numbers together, and I'll have an equation in for that definition. But otherwise, you're right that the, the economics examples, the equations, tend to be kind of rare. Uh, the inequalities are much more prevalent. Uh, when you say uh, there is a country example, uh, where, where does it come from? Where, where do you get your data? Or is it generated? Or? Well, when you, when you have this uh, set of Tarski formulas, these polynomial inequalities, and you ask, can it be satisfied with this being a bigger number than this? One of the things the machine's supposed to do is if it says, yes, it can be satisfied, tell me how. Give me numbers for everything, UH, UL, CL prime, NH, NL, TL, TAL H. Give me numbers for every single thing in this model. There's 16 things in the model. Give me 16 numbers where this would be satisfied and this violated. That, that's part of the quantum finer elimination process. Okay. Well, if it happens mathematically, does, does this uh, prove that it's going to happen in real life? No, no, that, this is why this, this example is less interesting. No one's worried that I'm talking about real life so they don't get passionate when I ask them. Okay. So we got their passion turned off. They're at their smartest, right? And they still have trouble because they still think, geez, I, this has got to be right. Um, it's proving the deduction is wrong. You don't need data. That, that, that the human deduction is, is wrong, right. Smart guys, deduction can be wrong. And then here's a counterexample. There's a Laffer curve in this economy. I've drawn it twice. One kind of zoom. The right hand is zooms in here. But the, this is the usual Laffer curve type of picture. The tax rate's down here. The revenue's over here. And it generally has this shape, so you can say have two tax rates that give the same revenue. There are some places here where there's more than two tax rates that give the same revenue. And the high utility ones are green, the low utility ones are red. And you can see there are cases here where the high utility is to the left of low utility. Actually getting uh, the higher tax rate gives the higher utility. Um, so it's possible. And one thing that's happening here, as I mentioned on the slide, this counterexample involves, and in fact, all counterexamples have to involve leisure being an uh, inferior good. Meaning when people have higher standard of living, they actually have less leisure. Normally, we're not willing to assume that. That's why there's no risk that this is a practical question. When people win the lottery, they don't say, boss, please give me more hours. The opposite. But still, as a logical, it shows you how it would help us to have a machine to do our logic because sometimes we make mistakes, um, even when we know somebody's trying to trick us, and even when there's no passion flowing. Um, here's a, the, my last type of example um, to show you kind of the breadth of things that can fit in the Tarski framework. Um, this comes from Sir John Hicks' analysis of consumer and producer theory. He, ca he called it the generalized law of demand. The usual law of demand we hear about is, hey, if there's a good that I'm purchasing and you all of a sudden charge me more, I'm going to buy less of it. That's the usual law of demand. But Hicks was interested in, hey, but there's lots of goods. What if we're changing lots of prices? What can I say about somebody's purchase patterns or a business's purchase patterns um, in that setting? Um, and what's interesting for our purposes today is you could think of that in terms of vectors. So P would be not... It's not just a number, it's a whole list of prices, a vector of prices. And Q is a vector of quantities that people choose of the same dimension. And they're ordered in the same way. Um, so we can express Hicks's theory in terms of, and I think he expressed it this way, in terms of uh, vectors. And we can give, set up the assumptions um, and then ask it, this is what Hicks concluded. He, Hicks concluded that the change in prices cannot be positively correlated with the change in quantities. So it doesn't mean item by item, the ones whose price went up are going to be consumed less. But on average, that's true in the correlation sense. Hicks concluded that. We can ask the machine, 
was Hicks correct about that? And yes, Hicks is correct in the sense that there exists no counterexample to what Hicks said. Um, what was nice here is that this is just a 10 variable problem. Even though the p vector could have been 6,000 units long. Because what Hicks had to say was only really the logic revolved around the dot products, not the elements of the vectors. And we have a lot of problems in economics like that, that uh, really we're talking about the dot products and not, not element by element sort of reasoning. So while Hicks's problem would seem complicated in the sense that there could be hundreds of thousands or millions of products involved, we can still answer it with the machine. Because the machine understands it really as a 10 variable problem. And it's automatic, right? I didn't have to type anything extra here and say, oh, by the way, please do vector analysis. It, it knows just by processing the input to tackle it that way. Um, and I said vectors and dot products. I mean, integrals, integral is a type of inner product. So you, would, you might, at first glance, you'd say, well, we're integrating a function. This guy, function's got an infinite number of points involved. We can never use quantifier elimination. We have to have a finite number of variables. Yeah, but it's like the dot product problem. I don't care about all those variables in, the rich, in their richness. I only care how they appear in terms of determining what the integral is going to be. And that's like a dot product. Yeah. So the inner product uh, in, the, in the case of V1 and V5 mm -hmm. uh, and, so other, and the V10 and so on, they are inner products of the same yeah. vector, so they are non-negative. So there's, a, there, there's some properties of these variables that you might need. Yeah, you, you got ahead of me. Um, that's right. Another thing that my interface does, it says, okay, my, it, it assumes that the user is not interested in imaginary elements in these vectors. And you're not interested either, right? Because that's why you said that. If you don't like that, you can't use my interface, okay? So given that they're not interested in imaginary values, then yes, this can't be negative. In fact, there's a gram matrix with all these, how many vectors are here? I think there's four vectors. The gram matrix of those four vectors has to be negative, I mean, positive semi-definite. I have a 50 50 chance of getting that right, but I did it right when I coded it. So it adds in extra assumptions to make sure that each element of the gram matrix is restricted. So there's an added assumption in there, p prime dot p prime greater than or equal to zero, even though we didn't type it. So a priori yeah. you work in algebraically closed field? Because you, see, you mentioned. In the yeah, we're using Tarski, and in fact, I'm using the real numbers version. Ah, real yeah. numbers version. Yeah. Okay. Yep. So those, here's the three examples to review. What's the type of computation output I think that we want? Obviously, every time we want a decision. Tell me which of the four boxes we're in, okay? Two of them we wanted an example, and two of them we also would be nice to summarize a class of examples. What is it about the example that makes it a counterexample? Um, for example, the supply curve being steeper than the demand curve or leisure being an inferior good. That's the type of output we're looking for. So you want to produce a formula which is true if and only if that kind of counterexample happens. Well, there's two, there's two types of formulas. One would be a sufficient condition. And the other would be a necessary and sufficient condition. And the latter tends to be more complicated than the former. Therefore, we might not want it. Depends. And my, my interface has a button for both. And it has a warning that says, by the way, if you do this one button, it's going to be more complicated than, than the other. Um, there are, I tried to make a count, use some American Economic Association information. Right now, I think there's, it, currently employed about 100,000 PhD economists who potentially do these kind of tasks. Um, and they would like these kind of things. They'd also like things like notification they forgot an assumption, which I've tried to build into my interface. Um, they'd also like to know if they've assumed too much, which happens uh, sometimes. It's funny, when I give these, ask the students to use this as part of their homework, their instinct is just to throw in lots of assumptions, and then the answer will be true. 
and then hit the button and say, okay, let's get rid of some of these assumptions. And it's pretty easy for a computer. Throw one out, rerun it. Throw two out, rerun it. No problem. Um, there are also, these are the PhD economists in practice. Any given year, there's lots of students taking economics. And I envision a case where, gee, they might benefit if they had this machine at their disposal. They could learn economics better, um, maybe with less training. Um, so I, potentially there's a big market for in economics for what you guys are doing. QE is the right tool for the job. You've probably got that idea already. Quantifier elimination can decide, can do decision problems for us, give us a formula. Here's my hypothesis. Here's my assumptions. Yellows, counterexamples. Orange are examples. As you discussed, maybe I want a formula for the orange. That would be necessary and sufficient conditions. Um, CAD can do that in principle. Maybe I just want to cut this, maybe project the, project the yellow down and say, okay, if I'm to the left of that line, I know I don't have to worry about yellow. That would be sufficient conditions. That's also a quantifier elimination problem. Um, so QE is the right tool for that. Um, what are some barriers to this? There are barriers because there aren't many of us doing this. So what are some of the barriers? Maybe part of it is just knowing that it's out there at our disposal. Yeah, that's part of it. Um, discovering the Tarski formula is a barrier. As I mentioned, there was kind of this mistake, the, the view that, oh, we can only use Tarski and, and others, derivatives of Tarski, when our demand curve is a polynomial and our supply curve is a polynomial. No, you can be more clever about the variables. Or we can't use Tarski when we have integrals. No, that's not correct. So this is a, this is a barrier. I've tried to build into my interface this, to discover the Tarski formula for the person and so they don't have to do that um, themselves. Preprocessing um, is important. We make typos and the machine takes what we take literally. So I've tried to uh, do that. We talked about earlier Another preprocessing step is to throw in the gram matrix restrictions. When somebody does vector mode, don't ask your user to come up with the Tarski formulas that guarantee a positive semi-definite gram matrix. The computer can figure that out and do it instantly and so on. So I've tried to build that in. Um, you know, what, what algorithm are you going to use? Don't want to burden the economist with, with that sort of decision. Um, and that's one thing I think Z3 does very well. There's things going in on under the hood there to decide which, what, how to tackle the problem. Uh, Mathematica is trying to do that. I think Redlog has, has aspects of that. Um, so that, I think that's important. If we're going to ask the economist user to make those kind of judgments, they're not going to be a user, I'm worried. So try to build that in. Another judgment that comes up in some of the methods, at least, is what sequence you'll want to eliminate the variables. Um, and I, I have my, my own uh, methods for that. They're kind of built into my interface. So the user never gets involved with that. You can query my interface after it's done and say, what, what order did you do the variables? And it'll tell you. But um, you don't really have to, as a user, worry about it if you don't want. Um, there's a distrust of machines. Just because the answer set, computer set is true, is it, can we believe the computer? Um, and that's why it's great we have different machines. You can ask Mathematica a question, ask Z3 the question. They say the same answer, they did it in pretty different ways. That, that's, uh, that's comforting. Another barrier that I've run into is that CAD is some of the method being used for the quantifier elimination has this reputation of being completely impractical. And I'm going to come to that later. Something must be wrong there because I just pressed the button for you a few times and it came up with the answer very quickly. Uh, you didn't see the very quickly part, but it did. So I'm going to talk a little bit about that. Um, another problem I run into, it's kind of laughable, um, but it, it's real. 
You know, like with tennis shoes, kids, all kids wear tennis shoes. But a lot of kids look to Michael Jordan as to what tennis shoe they want to wear. But you're not Michael Jordan. You're not even close to Michael Jordan. Why do you look at him? This is the same problem that there are theorists in, in my field who specialize in mathematical economics. It's not most of us. There's a few of us who specialize in mathematical economics who deal with problems that are too complicated for the Tarski framework. And the problem is that a lot of us are going to look to them and say, is it okay to use the Tarski framework? Oh, no, I, I don't use just like Michael Jordan don't wear the shoes, I, I don't use it, therefore nobody can use it. That, that's something I have, that's not your problem, but that's something I'm kind of grappling with. That most of us deal with problems that fit in the Tarski framework and actually are pretty easy to, for the machine to solve. And therefore most of us would benefit, even though if the Michael Jordans in my field wouldn't, uh, wouldn't benefit from that. So those are kind of the challenges. Um, I, think, I think we can deal with them, but, but they're there. So what's special? about these problems. They are, they are not random Tarski formulas that, that I'm putting in here. They come from economics. What's special about them? I have a data bank that I do a lot of work with, which uh, 10 vector problems, which aren't in this picture, and then 37 other problems. Um, they have lots of variables. The smallest number of variables is eight. Um, they have quite a few polynomials in there, typically more than 10, not always. Um, so quite a few variables, quite a few polynomials. Here's an example with, that has 101 variables. So they're not light on variables. Um, and so that alone would suggest to some people QE is impractical. Here's a couple quotes. When these algorithms have been discussed in economics, which is not much, but when they've been discussed, these are some of the things that people have said. No, you're never going to be able to do this. And practice, you're never going to be able to do more than five variables. I just showed you that I don't have a problem that's so small as five variables. They're all eight or bigger. But this is a concern. I get referee reports that say Casey can't be doing what he's doing because we all know that more than five variables is impossible. <laughs> it's, you know how referees are, right? So, so what, what's going on here? Um, well, the kind of origins of this some of the combinatorics of really polynomial intersections. You got a collection of polynomials, how many ways can they intersect? And if we got m polynomials and n variables, um, or n can be the total degree of all the variables added together, um, then as you do the projection phase in CAD, the number of polynomials you end up with is, has to do with the number of polynomials raised to a power that itself has number of variables and exponent. And if you do this for four, very small number, five, very small number by my standards, you get like eight billion. And this is the kind of reason that people said you're never going to do more than five variables because eight billion is a lot of polynomials to keep track of. Um, so what's going on here? Number one is we're not doing any quantifier elimination problem. We're doing decision problem of existential, existential sentence. There's one type of quantifier, no alternations. So that helps. Um, not a lot of equation constraints. Whether that helps or not, I don't know, but that's a feature of these examples. Not many disjunctions. So they tend to be just conjunctions. Um, that's, that's kind of special. This, I think, probably the single most important. They're sparse. Most of the variables are absent for most of the polynomials. Another, you might ask why I pick five, and I'll show you that in a minute. It's rare for a variable to appear in more than five polynomials. You might have one or two or three variables like that, but it's not many. Um, and that makes a big, big difference. Now, the polynomials have singularities. That is very, very common. It's very common to have two variables multiplying each other, really because we use the chain rule of calculus. That's that ends up with products pretty quickly. Here's an example from my Laffer curve model. One variable multiplied by another, multiplied by another. So there's singularities here where things disappear. And normally that's a burden to keep track of, but we rule those out by assumption. We're not interested in negative tax rates. We're not interested in negative amounts that people work or negative amounts that people consume. So where disjunctions might normally appear in some abstract procedure, they end up 
disappearing. We're proning out branches of the tree by assumption. And these are natural, natural assumptions. So that's, that's pretty helpful um, as well. The total degree is pretty large in the sense of these polynomials, uh, multivariate polynomials, four to eight, typically, because of the chain rule. We see already three here. But the own degree tends to be low. The two is the modal own degree in, in my examples, but, and three shows up sometimes. And I, maybe four does. But, so that, that's pretty helpful. Um, I think you put those, that together with the sparseness, uh, pretty helpful. Um, now, with that said, if you just take a, say, Brown's projection operator and you go to work, it's not going to work. That double exponential formula kind of kind of works okay, in the sense that the number of polynomials you'll be working with will probably be growing at an increasing rate. So I don't know if that's a doubly exponential, but it's super exponential. Um, so it must be that none of the machines that I'm using are doing this. Um, I think, which I think is right. Here's some, kind of my picture to kind of think about what's going on. Um, Remember I said, think of the number of polynomials we're talking about. Let's suppose they're all linear. We've already factored them. So here's how many polynomials we're putting in, and we're going to eliminate a variable. How many polynomials come out? That's what this chart shows. As a multiple of how many went in. So a 1 means however many you put in is how many you got out exactly. A 2 means you got twice as many out as you put in. Um, that double exponential formula is here. I've drawn that. But that's not really how it works. It's, it's the number of intersections of polynomials is a binomial question. And the double exponential is the leading term in the binomial, but it's not the binomial. The binomial itself I've shown in blue. And they're different. And the, the blue is below the red. In particular, if you're putting in three polynomials, it's a world of difference. The double exponential says you're going to grow at an increasing rate. And the actual nested binomial says, no, you don't grow at all. You put in three, you get out three. You put in three again, you get out three again, and you keep having three. So that's, that's one issue that, the, in small samples, that double exponential formula is not good. Now, I showed you, all my examples have more than three polynomials. But remember, this is about eliminating a variable. So when I go to eliminate a variable, it's pretty often that there's only three polynomials in which that variable appears. So that, that's one thing that's going on. The asymptotic approximation is not practical. The other thing that's going on, another thing that's going on, the Brown projection operator, the usual way of forming a full cat, kind of ignores the formula in which your polynomials appear, which is great in the sense that when you form a CAD to address these questions, you can address any Tarski formula you would assemble from those polynomials. So it's like you've solved hundreds or thousands of problems in one, with one tool, one application of one tool. But we don't need to solve hundreds of thousands of problems. We need to solve one problem. There's only one Tarski formula. We gave it, and that's all we want. So if you eliminate the intersections that aren't relevant to your formula, you get something more like the green line, half of the binomial. Because half of the intersections are in the interior or the, strictly the exterior of what you're looking at. You don't need to worry about them. Now the fixed point is five. So I put in five polynomials into a binomial over two. I'm going to get out five again. The double exponential says I'm going to get out more than ten. And then I'm going to have to run it again. But here my number of polynomials is not growing at all. So let's look at that Krugman example here. If I pry the prown, take the Krugman example, which has, um, I think, a 16 polynomials to start with, and apply the Brown projection operator in alphabetical order, I run out of memory after eliminating four variables. Kind of like what the people warned about. Now, it turns out if I don't do alphabetical order and I cut through it another way, I am able to finish the Brown projection phase. Although I get about 2,000 polynomials along the way. 
I only started with 16 and I end up with 2,000 that I'm keeping track of, but I can do it. If you use some of these other methods that pay attention to the formula that you're dealing with, then the number of polynomials really doesn't grow at all. Forget about growing at an increasing rate, it doesn't grow at all. That's kind of the binomial over two uh, thing. So this is part of where the sparseness um, is, is helping us. Sparseness and, and lower degree. Um, we are running out of time, so I will. For all my examples, 37 of them, I measured the decision time in Mathematica, and then I tried to do a, an empirical analysis, if you will, of how long it takes to decide each of these this Tarski formulas as a function of what's the properties of the Tarski formulas, how many variables it has, how many polynomials it has. Um, and kind of the two best predictors are, well, do you have four or more things that are appearing in five or more polynomials? Because I had in mind that five fixed point. And how many are appearing in three or more polynomials, that three fixed point? And those tend to be the best, best predictors um, of, of when they finish. Okay. I don't have time for, well, I'm just going to mention, as I go through these examples, eliminating a variable, and then eliminate another one, I end up seeing the same generic problem recurring over and over, which kind of suggests, and we put together in a paper, we're just putting out now with uh, some of the people over in Bath, um, that Maybe you don't even have to do quantifier elimination at all. You do it in the factory, kind of memorize a few quantifier elimination problems. And then you can plow through these examples just going in back to your library of answers to quantifier elimination problems. It's the same ones keep showing up. Here's, I'm running out of time, so I'll just get a quick example. I have a problem that, that Z3 wasn't able to solve. Uh, Mathematica has a lot of trouble with it. And it ends up that this, I keep seeing this popping up, a linear equality, a linear inequality, and a quadratic inequality, both strict. That shows up over and over and over again. So if I just solved it once, I could memorize the answer, here's the answer, and then apply it. Now when it shows up, there are different coefficients, so different things are appearing there, but I just make substitutions. So this kind of, uh, um, Building blocks. Now this is in generically true about polynomials. You can't, but it seems like these examples, in fact, I've worked through all of them, you keep seeing the same building blocks over and over. If you, if you could just memorize 10 or 12 quantifier elimination problems, you could go a long way towards solving these without, in real time, having to build any kind of CAD or, or doing anything like that, because you've seen the same problem over and over. Okay, so I'm running out of time. Um, there's a few other things if we have time to talk about it afterwards today or um, through the email. In kind of working with these examples, we, I kind of have some ideas about how to eliminate variables, which, which a way to cut through the problem. Um, how can I use SMT formula to give me, uh, SIT solver to give me formula answer instead of a SAT or an unsat answer? And there's, I have some ideas around that. I think a SAT solver can be extremely useful for things, SMT solver for things maybe hadn't thought of before, um, economics in general, but I think a lot of questions where there's formula output desired, I think SMT solver can do a lot for that. So thank you for attention. I look forward to working with you guys and again, appreciate the product that you put together. Thank you. number of quantifier alternations that you have in these problems? Oh, zero or one. It, existential sentence is the workhorse. I see. So you don't have like for all exists or exists for all problems? I've had a few of those. They're not in my data bank. And then there might be one. Um, there's some interest in my field in that. Um, it would be much smaller, I would think, than the interest in is there a counterexample to what I just said? That, that sort of 
question like Krugman posed or I did with the Laffer curve. That is, that is really the workhorse. Thanks, guys. Yeah. Where did the empiricists come in on this? I mean, when you're, you come out with the, uh, the model comes out with a particular counterexample, um, how do you judge whether it's uh, plausible in, in reality with respect to experimental data? Well, but that's kind of how I view theory work. And theory said, okay, this policy makes sense in this set and doesn't make sense in this set. This machinery tells us what those sets are. And then we can leave it to the empiricists and say, hey, okay, go out there and t here's what you guys need to look for. Yes, they need theorists to guide for them what to look for. They don't know what to look for on their own. What their reaction is. When you tell them, go look for this, do they, uh, are they receptive to it? Well, the idea, like that elasticity result I showed you, it was a very old result before I was born. Uh -huh. And there's a lot of work in empirical economics trying to measure elasticities. I think you asked earlier, did, did, what do we know about the slopes of those curves? They've been researching that, and there's a reason, because there's policy questions that hinge on it. So... Um, they're responsive. In the long run, I think they're responsive. In the short run, I, it's harder to say. Thanks, guys.